He's not a theological figure. He's the way. And he's the truth. So if he's the truth, we were living in a lie. If he's light in the darkness, we were in the darkness. So guys, the way we thought, rationalized, and reasoned has a slant to it and a can to it. It has a twist to it. So I've said this for years. If the gospel could change your perspective, then he's already begun to change your life. If he can get you to think different and live from a different place and wake up in the morning with a different reason for being, well, then life's going to step into the freedom that it was designed for and the influence and the impact. See, because a lot of us wake up and we try to get through. We try to make it. Next thing you know, life's a grind. Or now i got to face this. Or I'm dreading this. Or, boy, i got a lot on my plate. And next thing you know, your mindset, if you really break it down and look at it, is totally self-focused, self-centered. Next thing you know, you incorporate God into your life in hopes of a better life instead of a brand new one. And that's the trap. And a lot of good-meaning people that see their need for a Savior don't understand that the gospel wants to transform their whole reason for being and the why behind their life. So you can actually see your need for a Savior, believe in Jesus, believe He died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, and actually qualify for what we call salvation and fail to become love, die to yourself, or pursue this new way of thinking. And actually be as frustrated, discouraged, disheartened, and let things speak louder than Him and let people and stuff decide who you are. Because you're never a victim. Jesus wasn't a victim. He's the living epistle of love and the expression of the Father. In the face of injustice and blasphemy and gossip and, and wrong judgment, he, come on guys, everything came to Jesus that could possibly come. He was tempted at all points, yet without sin. He faced everything in his life that you'll ever face. So he didn't just come and preach a sermon to you, he lived the sermon. Jesus is amazing. So he modeled a life that we were created for. And he revealed who the Father is to us and showed us what life looks like in the Father when we seek ye first the kingdom of God. If you seek first your well-being, you're only as good as things are going. If you need people to change, you're only as good as they're changing. And all of a sudden, you're going to let a thing decide who you are and sing he's Lord. And he's not even the one governing your life. Next thing you know, you reduce to praying for help instead of responding and shining in the truth in the face of all things. Are you guys making sense of this? Come on, it's so powerful because you got a young lady just power packed with destiny, future, potential. Jesus already died and shed his blood for her. He knows the truth about her. Come on, he didn't shed his blood for a loser and a victim. He shed his blood for a woman of God that he wants to fill with his spirit and reveal himself through. He didn't have to die on the cross just because she's a mess and going to continue to be a mess. He had to die because of our sins, guys. But he didn't die because we're sinners. He died to restore a truth. He paid a price to put his life back into her. So here he is moving and changing her perspective. And all of a sudden, she watch. When you don't see yourself as a victim anymore, those effects of feeling sorry for yourself, those effects of why and how, and that identity you receive through a victim mentality just fades away. You don't even have to try to change it. It changes in your new belief in the truth that makes you free. That's why I get passionate about it. I apologize. I've just seen too many good things happen, and, and I've seen too many lies eat too many years. In a short time I've been saved, I've only been saved 21 years. I've been at the full-time level of ministering and pastoring for 19. It's a different kind of story. It's been fun. I've been very active and very involved, very face-to-face. -face. I've been very, you noticed I'm a very personal fellow. I don't speak and sneak out somewhere. I'm here, I make myself available. I came to this small setting on purpose. I knew I was coming to a small setting. I'm not surprised by it. It's intimate to me. I'm looking at the face of people that hung, have hunger, and I'm looking at people that matter and have impact and carry a weight of influence, whether you realize it or not. Right here on the front row is spheres of influence. And you all make up a big picture of impact when we walk in the truth. That's actually called the outpouring of God. We're waiting for some mystical thing to happen. And God's saying, go ye therefore, let your light so shine before men. Make peace, walk in love, show mercy. It's probably the gospel. <laughs> it's not have issues, get people troubles, call for counsel because you're ticked off, get burned out and draw back. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Here's what happens. We're born into Adam. 
We're born into a lie. We grow up not knowing who we are, finding ourselves along the way. And our story starts defining our life and sculpting and etching the individual that we are. And all of a sudden, by a young age, you're a product of what you've been through, what happened and what didn't happen. And you interpret that and everybody makes sense of that. And we all agree that that's what that's what's real. But the gospel says none of that is who you are and none of that is who you're created to be. And if the people in your life really knew who they were and were really filled with God, they wouldn't have lived the way they lived and done the things they've done. So why are we letting all those things matter more when they aren't the thing that matters most? And that's what the gospel wants to do. It wants to change the truth about you because we're believing a lie most of the time. Insecure at a young age sometimes. If we're popular, that could be a problem because that goes to your head and creates something even in a different arena, stronghold. Here's what I'm getting at. I preached this the other night, but I got a lot of new faces. When God made man in the beginning, and I'm going to look at something. I want to establish something this morning, so be patient with me. There's somewhere we're heading right now. I I usually don't see it. I'm usually on a journey with you, but I see it right now, and it has me a little excited. In the beginning, God said, let us make man. Let us. He makes man. He breathes into him. Man becomes a living being. But he didn't just make man. He said, let us make man in our... As we said in 26 of Genesis 1, in 27, it said, so God, he made man. He did it. He talked about it in 26. In 27, he did it. He didn't wait around. Bam! He makes man. But he didn't just make man. He made man in his image and his own likeness. He empowered him to subdue, to carry the authority and the fullness of who God is. What God was doing was revealing himself through man. He was multiplying himself through man. Man, so Adam's like, he's like God's son, right? He's he's in the image of God and in his likeness. He reaches into Adam and brings out a woman. He doesn't make another lump of clay. He reaches into the fullness of God in the man. Understand, people, he's complete. He's fulfilled. He's not insecure. He's not self-centered. He's like God. He's love. He didn't make a woman because he's lonely. You're not here to meet a man's need. You're here to complement the image of God that when one plus one come together in a covenant, they make a stronger one and multiply the image of God through union, relationship, and family till the whole earth is filled with his glory. But you enter in sin and cutting off from that whole picture and now man's inward and self-centered and self-justified and self-protecting and self-defending and self-ingenuity. And all of a sudden he's a God unto himself and We don't even see what's happened. And now we're all born into that lie. So Adam gets cut off from love and the source of love. And instead of being love, now he's a vacuum and he's in need of love. Everybody in this room and everybody on the earth was born into that. And not one of us had a clue who we were when we were born. We were figuring that out along the way, but it was always hinged on a lie because it was wrapped around feelings, emotions, needs. Needs to be valued, needs to be accepted, needs to be encouraged. So if those people weren't in your life, you didn't feel like you were worthy. You actually had your esteem crushed by the weakness of men. And now you're only as strong as the weakness around you. And all of a sudden you can't see the truth about you because all these lies are speaking so loud. Now you have insecurity, identity crisis, eating disorders, self-focus, (sighs) self-consciousness. And we call it type this and this personality and this. No, it's all lies. It's all about the image of God. The thing is, we were created for His image and none of us grew up pursuing to live for His image. It's like functioning a machine outside of what it was made for. Oh, this thing's just in me. It it just makes sense to me because I live my whole life this way. I was so full of pride and didn't even like myself. I just needed to appear to be something. It was survival. I I would say one thing and be a whole other person on the inside. I was just saving face and getting by. We live so shallow and surface because we're living for the moment and we're trying to leave an impression because we're full of needs. Come on, I'm just talking plain. And everybody in this room knows what I'm talking about. And some get crushed in this thing more than others. And some it's more evident than others. And some aren't as blatant and expressive with it. And some are extreme. I understand there's different levels. But it's the same lie and it's the same thing. And it's hindered us all. And it's affected every one of us. You could be in third grade and somebody laughs at what you're wearing. And two other kids laugh. And you either become introverted or a fighter. 
And all of a sudden, the circumstance is telling you who you are instead of the truth of your creative value in the living Christ. And all of a sudden, you're a product of your environment and your surroundings and your happenings instead of the one that wants to live inside of you. Are you guys following me? Am I too intense? Are you okay? I mean, you guys, what are you doing right on the front row? Oh, I'm proud of you guys, man. There's a whole string of you in the back the whole time, which is cool because you're just sitting there listening and I'm pumped. But you're right. There's a whole other front row for any of you brave people, you know. Afraid I'm going to spit on you, aren't you? If I do, you just rub it in. Thank you, Jesus. No, I'm just being gross. <laughs> Let us make man in our image, in our own likeness, in his image, in his own likeness, he made man. So what's the cross all about? What's Jesus dying on the cross? The forgiveness of sins? Of course. Is that where it stops? Not a chance. That's the very beginning. The forgiveness of sins empowers you to have new life. It makes you right with the Father. We just sang he's our high priest. He, he's our high priest between God and man. He represents man to God and God to man. He stands on behalf of man's at the right hand. His blood speaking better things. He's given us access and relationship and reunion with God. So Jesus comes up from the dead and breathes back on man and takes him back to the beginning and redeems man's life and destiny identity back to the beginning as if sin never happened. I taught it last night. So we reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive unto God. Through his blood he made us holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If we keep believing that it aren't moved away. Guys, it's not pride. It's not presumption. It's not heresy. It's God's word. You've got to understand he washed you clean. He changed you through the blood. You have to start where he finished if you're going to run well. You have to say no to the victim mentality. You have to let the gospel illuminate you and say, Whoa, a minute. I've been living insecure. I need people to say the right thing, to feel all right. Man, I've been living for attention. Wow, I need reputation. Jesus made himself of none. There's a twist here. Things are backwards. No wonder I'm struggling. Wow, life's not a grind. Life's a gift. I don't need to fit in with everybody. I need to be like him. And when I be like him, I'll be walking in purpose and grace will be flowing. See, that's the goal. The goal of our instruction is love. The purpose of the commandment, this thing is taking us back to the beginning, to God's image, God's likeness, and God's nature. That's why Ephesians 3 says that, that above all these things, see, that, 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 that to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge is to be filled with all the fullness of God. That's Adam in the garden. He did not make a woman because he was lonely. He made a woman so there was an avenue of multiplication and expression through covenant and oneness. Because he made man to express himself. Now where's man go with all he is? Where how does man multiply? Man, what a gift, life. <laughs> People say, well, it's my life. No, no, you're wrong. It's his life in you. That's what he created you for, and that's what he paid for, his life in you. It's never just your life. It's the biggest lie in the world, and sometimes the church. I've heard people in counseling say, well, it's my life. You're way wrong. It's never been your life. It's always been designed to be his life in you, his life in you. So watch this, church. I'm encouraging you this morning so that you don't get trapped and snared in things that aren't necessary. Watch this. I'm, this is a loving thing. It's not a correcting thing. I'm not showing you what you're not. I'm telling you who you are. Watch this. If God made man for his image and likeness and we wake up and pursue less than his image and likeness, then we're pursuing and living for something we're not here for. The first thing is to seek his kingdom first. First. Not your well-being. Not your provision. Not your blessing. His kingdom. If you think for his kingdom first and his righteousness and understand where you stand before him through the blood, it keeps your heart humble, your heart diligent. It brings back in a true sense of healthy honor and diligence. It's so good. Yeah? Whew. Seek ye first. <laughs> not a strong friendship, not a spouse, not a better job. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. You've got to think for the kingdom. You've got to understand once you're a Christian, you've got to understand why you're a Christian. It's not just to be forgiven and go to heaven. It's to be transformed and get a new perspective and begin to become like him. So you live from his heart, from his motives, from his ways. You get it? So powerful. 
That's how you'll have influence and impact without trying to be evangelistic and carrying the weight of dutiful evangelism like everybody thinks, well, I'm supposed to evangelize. Evangelize with your life, your attitudes, your motives, and your love. Love is evangelistic without any effort. (laughs) The goal of our instruction is love. Come on, how easy was it to have an attitude, hard heart, and get angry? People still struggle with it every day, and the lie is we call it normal. The Bible says put off anger. Why? You were never made for it. You were made for love. Because when you're angry, you're taking things account for yourself and how it affects you and how you disagree and how you don't like that and how it bothers you. And and all of a sudden, it's all about you. And it's a prideful, self-righteous, deceptive expression, deceived expression. And the trouble is we think it's normal because we were trained by it from little up. Nobody taught you how to be angry. It was just there. You were two years old and don't even remember, and a little kid you're playing with might have tried to take the toy you were playing with. You'll see the anger's there. And they never saw their parents hit each other. They never even, nobody taught them that. It's just there. One and a half years old, precious. I love kids so much. That one little seven-year-old came up to me last night. He said, boy, you really love children. Yeah, I think Jesus does. And he's in me, so it's not my fault. <laughs> it's fun when a seven-year-old boy comes up, wraps his arm around and says, boy, you really love children. I said, yes, I do, son. <laughs> as precious as they are, one and a half years old, you take something they want to hold on to. You don't give them something they want right now. And you'll find that everybody's going to need save someday. I had a mama come to me. She said, I'm so afraid my baby's possessed. How did my baby get a demon? I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, I'm so failing as a mother. She said, my little girl, she's so tiny. We've been careful to be. This lady, if you knew her, you, it's a hilarious story. She is the sweetest thing on the planet. This lady, like when she's mad, she'll tell a story and say, I was so mad. And you're like, okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, she's just so sweet. She's like a flower's not even in season. She walks by and it just bloom, you know. She's just precious, right? And she's like, I'm a failure of a mother. And my, my daughter might have a demon. Why? Because she, she threw a fit and she made a face at her and went, Nye. And the mother was devastated because she's so sweet and tender and kind. And she's thinking, if all I ever show her is this, that's all she'll ever know and that's all she'll ever be. And yet that nature, that thing you're born into called Adam, just went, yeah. And she thought it was a demon. (laughs) She said, I think I'm really failing as a mother. I said, honey, you're probably the most incredible mother on the planet or in the top. You know, because I've met some amazing mothers. I said, Here's the simple point. Someday your little girl's going to need born again. So don't get discouraged. Don't get condemned. And don't draw your identity from her. And what you, you draw your identity from Jesus. You shine and you be like Jesus to your little girl in the face of all that stuff. And one day, soon, at a young age, she's going to recognize that in mama. It's going to draw her and attract her. And one night you might be tucking her in bed. And she might at the age of six years old say, Mommy, you're so different than me. Mommy, why don't, my boy came to me when he was eight and he cried. He said, Dad, can we talk? And I said, well, sure, we can talk, buddy. He's kind of pointing at everyone. He wants to talk in private because it was about sister and mom. (laughs) So I said, let's go. We go in and sit down. This is a good testimony for a daddy, right? And don't you get condemned by this. Get empowered by this. Don't be judged by this. Sometimes it's hard to even tear stuff because we hear, like, well, that counts me out. Well, I sure blew that. Well, get out of that ear. You hear things to be empowered, not to be judged. You hear things to know it's possible. You see what I mean? Not to be judged by it. It's never the heart of God. You think I flew down here to judge you, correct you? I came out here to tell you who you are and what's possible. Because I believe it. He pulled me in the room and he said, Dad, I don't know 
how you don't get angry. I, I see some things that happen. My mom, my wife, his mommy was struggling at the time with some wrong beliefs in, in our lives. And it was really in the heat of all that when he said this. He said, I hear what mommy says sometimes and see how she acts sometimes. And if I was you, I would be furious. He was eight years old. He said, Dad, and I don't see you ever get mad. See, you think that ain't possible, but it's how I live. He said, I don't understand, Daddy, how you don't get angry because right now I am so angry at my sister and my mom. <laughs> and I said, well, let me explain how. I said, because there was a time I was so touchy. There was a time I'd get angry for nothing. There's a time I'd so overplay things and I'd be livid for no reason because I was, I was just lost. So look how extreme. I'm born again. I got new life through Jesus Christ. I've put off the old man and his deeds. I don't have a Christian confession and church attendance. I have a new life, a new way of thinking, a new reason for being. I get out of bed for a new reason now. I have relationship and fellowship with God. I'm alive for his image, not my preference. I'm alive to love you, not need you. <laughs> oh man, see, that just gets me so fired up inside. Because <laughs> it, it's powerful. Everything else is so weak. You're just hanging on a string, one little people button, and your disposition's wrecked for a whole day or a week. And now it's your saga, and you live off the fuel for a week, even though it's negative. And it's the only excitement in your life. So and so said this, and I'm mad, and we did, and it's just, ah! <laughs> But you go to church on Sunday because that's where you belong. <laughs> Holy. Oh, ah! It's not cool. It's just not cool. <laughs> he said, I just don't know how, Daddy. And I, I talked to him about living for yourself, thinking for yourself, taking things personal. And I, I explained to him how to become love, and, and that anger is not in your created value. It's, it's, if you're anger, it says, be angry and do not sin. And people sometimes use that as <laughs> alibi for anger. How is it possible to be angry and not sin? When you're angry and full of emotion, you know how passionate I get when I preach? It's never at the cost of you, your identity, your destiny, because that's the whole thing I'm empowering the whole time. When you're angry at the cost of a human being and his identity and you're cutting him off in your anger or seeing him less than he's created for, that's sin. The Bible calls hate murder. New Testament. Hate is murder because you see a man for what you despise. It's a self-righteous judgment. You cut him off. You stop his potential where you're not happy and you cut off him because all you see him for is what you hate. And it's like killing a man in your own eyes and heart, even though he can still live and thrive and be with Jesus. But what I'm saying is where you're concerned, it's judgeable of murder because you can't see him for what he's created for. You see him for what you despise. See, the reason love never fails, guys, is because God never sees you for face value. He sees you for created value. He knows what he made you to be. That's where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Not to empower sin, to bring the best out in you and call you higher. It's the goodness of God that leads you to change, not the reprimand of God. That's why I'm so, can you tell I'm freaked out by this gospel? Like, change. This is 21 years. So I'm either a great actor or this thing's in me. See, I live this way. My little eight-year-old boy, I live this way. My eight-year-old boy knows it in the house, calls daddy in the room, says, you're different than me. Why am I so angry and I don't see you angry and I feel like you have a right to be more angry than I am, dad, and I'm really angry. And I watch my little eight-year-old boy slide to the floor and get on his knees and say, can we pray? Because I don't want this anger in my life. And I said, you better believe we can pray. There was a time I was going through something where I was dragging my leg around and I had no use of it for 10 days. It was like a big hunk of rubber. I won't go into detail. It was witchcraft. I don't want to freak you out with that, but stuff's real. Come on, we're in a spiritual thing. And, 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 and there was things going on at church and there was witches coming and there was urine on the door handles and chantings at night and people were freaking out. And I'm saying, come on, guys, you ought to be excited. They're here. They're hearing the gospel. And, and then this thing comes on me. And the Lord showed me it was voodoo and it was different stuff and it's very real. And, and it was like my leg was there, but it wasn't. And my daughter saw me suffering with this for 10 days because it, the, the pain that came into it at times, even though it was useless, it was this pain that came in that I can't even describe. And one night I remember sweetly looking at her and saying, 
Good night, honey. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? I said, have a good night rest. And I was crawling up the stairs like a slug, just crawling because I couldn't walk. And I smiled gently at her and my daughter just started bawling. And I turned around and I said, honey, it's okay. I said, don't be upset. Daddy's going to be fine. We're going to work through everything. Jesus is amazing, sweetie. It's okay. She said, I'm not crying because your leg's messed up. And I said, well, why are you crying? She said, because you never change. If I was in your shoes, I would be freaking out, and you're so nice. My eight, eight, or however old she was, I'm sorry, she was about 14 at the time. No, she wasn't. Yeah, she was about that old. She lost it because she knew that if she was going through what I was going through, she would be an emotional mess and full of complaints. And why me? And where are you, God? And how can you let me go through this? And she didn't see me any different as when my leg worked totally fine. That's the kingdom of God and the gospel. You want that testimony inside the hearts and eyes of your children. (laughs) I read the note to you the other day from my wife. Some of you didn't hear it, but I'm pretty excited about it because she's not a YouTube follower. She lives with me every day. 34 years we've been married. The last 21, I've been a lover of Jesus. You say, you're boasting on yourself. I'm calling you to what's possible. Hope you have the best weekend ever. Sticking in my Bible, a little sticky note, pink. Hope you have the best weekend ever. You're a true man of God. And I doubt God knows this is her because she lives with me and she doesn't know everybody. I doubt God can find many men, if any, on this earth with your integrity, character, and your good heart. It's about two months ago we were in the house and she just looked at me and started bawling. I said, honey, what's wrong? Are you okay? I'm okay. She said, it's just you, your character, just your love for God. I don't think I thank you enough. You make me cry. Because she knows I have zero compromise in my life. I have no room for sin, no room for an attitude that's not edifying. I won't permit it in my heart. And if it tries to come there, I will crush it with the truth. I am my best accountability partner because I'm born again. (laughs) And the biggest lie is, well, we're all going to have our moments, brother. You're preaching perfection. No, I'm not. I'm preaching purity. Because if I find myself outside of that, I deal with it quickly and run to God and get wiser and sharper and empowered. I'm not preaching perfection. I'm preaching purity. Well, brother, we're all going to have our moments. No, that's why you have yours. Because you still have permission for it. And you still think it's normal and you have a runway so the plane comes in freely. You take away the runway and see if the plane has anywhere to land. Stop believing who it's who you have to be. Stop believing that if somebody in your peer group busts on you openly or blogs you or Facebooks you in a negative way that it has to shake you and rock you. Stop believing it and believe that Christ in you is greater and your life will reveal that. And all of a sudden you're not falling apart because of the statement of one person and the whole world saw it. What's it matter if it's not true? You and your heart need to know who you are in Christ. Have a clear conscience. Look in the mirror and know who you're looking at. Yeah? Or you're going to let life speak way louder than truth. And that's a problem because truth makes you free. I'm not mad at you. I'm a little intense right now. I just feel that I don't want you living in those lies. You're way more than that. Jesus thinks you're worth his blood. That's pretty intense. (laughs) Come on, man. This is not an Easter story where we get sentimental. The Son of God became a man. My little new friend back there is carrying a baby. And it's pretty obvious. And, and, and that's what Jesus did. Jesus went inside of a woman and he's God. It's radical. It's like ridiculous. It's Think about it. It's not an Easter story. It's not a Christmas baby in a manger thing. It's real. God became a man. He got planted inside of a woman. He came through her birth canal and was birthed like we were. No shortcut. Captain of our salvation. Perfect sacrifice. A man at every point. Tempted at all points. You can't tempt God, so he had to be a man. Yeah? God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Manhood, right? If he came as God, why would God have to anoint him? 
There's just two examples that he came as a man. Yeah. He thinks so much of our creative value and what he created us to be and what's possible when he's in us and we're surrendered that he thinks it's worth doing all this for to redeem the package. And we've turned it into a prayer that secures me for heaven. And then we hold on and ride out the hell. Are you kidding me? I have new life. I have a whole new understanding and reasoning for being. And the perspective of the cross has transformed my life. And here's the point. You either want this or you don't want this. You either hear it and say, I want it, or you hear it and say, whatever. That's your privilege. But I promise you, there's two groups of people on the planet. People that believe the gospel and their life reveals what they believe, not their church attendance and words. Their life. Your life's going to reveal your faith. Not your speech. So there's two people. People that want this and become this and people that don't become this because they really don't want this. They hold on to the rights that Adam gave them instead of the right to be like him. It's always puzzled me how we deny ourselves and have all these rights, feelings, attitudes. Well, he shouldn't have. Well, if she wouldn't have. Well, I'm just mad. Well, I don't think I'm coming to this church anymore. Well, they bother me. Die already and do yourself the biggest favor. <laughs> Seriously, you think everybody else is your problem and you are your biggest stumbling block. You living for you is so outside of why you're here. That's why it's so miserable. Life is a grind when you're living for you. Because then everything has to go through your approval and all that stuff and everything that everybody does decides how you are. And somehow we got deceived that this is all about me, but we sing it's all about him. Guys, I'm not talking about unbelievers that never went to church. I'm talking about church folks that are broken and hurt and mad and gossiping and bickering. And the world is so not impressed with a church on every street corner. They, they, they think we're a joke most of the time. Because we got as much issues. If we had a little smut magazine, we'd have as much stuff in our magazine as they do. I'm not being mean. I'm being relatable. I don't think our lives have impressed them. But they sure can. And I'm not talking to you personally. Your life might be impressing somebody. I'm talking as the body of Christ at large. I'm not talking to you individually. Are you guys following me or is this too hardcore? Come on, because if we aren't living for this, what are we doing? Like if we don't become love and get restored back to his image, we're missing the whole point. We're doing a lot of church, prophesying each other, Bible study, holy, and living without true impact and missing the whole point. And we're all waiting for God to come and he's here. Boy, we sure need a move of God. He said, get moving. <laughs> Boy, it sure is dry, brother. We need a move of God. We need an outpouring. And he's thinking, I've already poured out. Would you guys pour out? Look, I preach this and I'm not, man, I'm not trying to just keep pounding this thing in a, in, in, in a hardcore way, but it's just here. It's in my heart. I'm just going to believe it's God and. There's just two groups in the Bible in Matthew 25. You got, you got sheeps, you got goats. And when you look at it, it's like, whoa, sheeps and goats. And, and, but, but if you really look at the story of the sheeps and goats, the only difference, the only difference between the two groups, the one group lived outside themselves, recognized the needs of others and loved people. And the other group didn't see them and just lived for themselves. It didn't say they never prayed a prayer to go to heaven. It said they never loved anybody outside themselves. And when they saw people hungry, they didn't care. And when they didn't notice it, and when they just saw people naked, they didn't see it. When people were in prison, they didn't visit. When people were not. He said, when you fail to do it to the least of these, you fail to do it to me. The only difference in your Bible between the two groups was that the one group lived outside themselves and the others didn't. You check your Bible and see if I'm not telling you the truth. And we get religious and make it all about praying a prayer instead of becoming a life. My own daughter, in her mid-teens, late teens, senior year, got into a real crisis in her life with emotions and stuff. And she was coming to me, talking to me. And I, I was glad. And I was fathering her and pastoring her. And, 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 and she was doing really good. And... 
And then her little emotional heart took a shift and things. And it, it was boy stuff. And she'd never had a boyfriend. She just lived such a way. Her class would joke and mock her and say she was gay because she doesn't have a boyfriend. And she said, I'm not gay. I'm just filled with Jesus. I don't need a boy. Well, that's weird. Why, how are you filled with Jesus? He just completes and fulfills my identity. I talk to him every day and pray. And it was just a good, healthy thing. And then she got caught up in this thing. So I'm trying to father her and pastor her. So she went to the so extreme that once she got her little heart pulled into this thing, she just went after it. So she told me one day, you know, she's going to do this. And, and I said, well, what about what you've become? What about the gospel? Not even just your testimony to the kids. What about you, creative value, the gospel? Well, talked around it because desire was divided heart. And she went through this door as if, the gospel wasn't, and you think this is too hardcore. It's not. I said, honey, don't get religious on yourself. You're only cheating yourself. Don't get religious. I said, so you're in this scenario. You're carrying this thing out. And, and, and you, you, you through communication, it's not blindness. I'm her daddy. I'm laying this thing out. And she's crying the whole time and saying, whatever. That's scary. I said, so don't get so religious that, you know, Something happens, uh, car crash, you guys get wiped out, man. Something crazy happens. I'm not prophesying doom. I'm just giving you an analogy. So what's Jesus going to come? Oh, honey, come with me. Praise God. I'm so glad you prayed that prayer. You, you never prayed that prayer. I don't even know you. I said, honey, you're making yourself the same. You're, you're trapped. You're, See, the church goes crazy over those kind of analogies because we just want to believe a self-serving gospel that benefits me and doesn't transform me. The reason we fight over once saved, always saved is because people backslide and don't live sincere and surrendered. It's the only reason it's a conversation. <laughs> it's the only reason it's an argument because people want to live barely saved. <laughs> and it's not even scriptural. Oh, it's sadly funny. I'm laughing or I'll cry. Please don't let that be you, because if you're walking in that arena, however it works out theologically in the end, that's not the point. Your impact and your influence is the point. You're the light of the world. Jesus said you're the light of the world. You're the roster of heaven right here in Macomb. You're the best he's got. And he believes you're enough, because he shed blood for it. Come on. This isn't too hardcore militant. Be okay. I'm smiling the whole time. If I was mean and mad and glaring at you, you'd probably have to be concerned. But I'm not saying this to hurt your heart. I'm saying it to encourage your heart. Don't let simple, petty things matter so much that it changes who you are when Christ has come and Christ in you is the hope of glory. To me, this is a Sunday morning message. It's why we gather. We don't gather to pay homage to God. We gather to be encouraged and stirred up and loving good works and leave looking a little more like him than when we came. I've learned a long time ago, it takes two to tango, it takes one to make peace. Pursue peace in your homes, pursue peace in your marriages. You say, well, you don't know what it's like living with my spouse. Well, maybe you ought to know what it's like living with Jesus inside of you. Because he might have a different view of how you're responding. He might have a little different take on your feelings and emotions. <laughs> and he might be able to help you. <laughs> <laughs> and it might help pastors with their counseling appointments and their time. <laughs> See, you don't understand. I am so militant about this. Like, and people say, wow, you're a loving guy. And I am loving. I, my motive's pure, but I'll talk to you plain. If I see you live in something that's hurting you, I'm going to talk to you about it in a heartbeat. I'm not going to call a friend and say, can you believe they're doing that? No, 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 no. I'm going to pull you aside and say, what's going on with you? I'm actually, I feel like I'm a good friend. I've marriage counseled with people, marriage counselors. Do you ever see this stuff? I don't know if you've seen this, Dan. You pull the marriage counseling in and they got the chairs there for the husband and wife and they sit in the chair and they can in a little and can in a little. And I'm not kidding you. And they're facing that way and you're sitting there, you're the pastor, they called the appointment. And you say, guys, man, you're like, <laughs> Okay, listen, man, obviously you got a lot of stuff going on. And we think, we think, well, we got to be real sensitive. Wow, this is really embroiled. Wow, this must really be bad. And then we put kick gloves on and we almost treat them like little children. 
You don't want to call an appointment with me if you're not ready for Jesus and do that to me. I love you way too much to let you do that to yourself. So you say, do either one of you want to just start and share where we're at and how we can help? Well, ask him. He knows everything. Well, she's the mouth in the family. Why don't you talk to her? She'll have plenty to say. I'm not exaggerating. Do you ever see anybody in that place that go to church and maybe serve in a ministry and hand out bulletins? And all you're doing is revealing you go to church, but you don't know Jesus at all. And I'm talking straight. Because if you don't love, you don't know him. That's what your Bible says, not my sermon notes. So here's what I do. I say, listen, guys, I'm gentle, but I'm sharp as a... I say, listen, guys, I'm a little puzzled right now. I know you called this appointment, and I know you guys are overseeing such and such a ministry and all that, and you feel like you want counsel and help, but I, I need to ask you guys a question. I'm asking both of you personally. Are you guys born again? That's how I handle it. They usually get offended. Say, oh, pastor, what are you talking about? We've been coming to your church for three years. You know we're born again. Listen, coming to the church doesn't make you born again. Christ-likeness is born again, and there's not one thing in your life right now that remotely looks like him. So why would you sit here and call an appointment and be so deceived? Get your eyes on yourself, feel sorry for yourself, hate one another, and call me into an appointment where I have no voice because until your attitude changes, there's no one that can help you. Until you repent, there's not a chance of change. And it doesn't start with each other. It starts with you. So either let's get straight right now or let's just call the appointment and you just go live in torment because I can't help you if all you think for is yourself because it's anti-finished work of Jesus and kingdom. That's how hardcore I am in an appointment like that. And you ought to see the testimonies I have of people breaking, crying, changing. I've never had anybody punch me in the mouth. And if you would, oh, well, I had a nine-year-old boy beat me up. I did. He had behavioral issues. He didn't have a demon and everybody was trying to cast a devil out of him. And I scolded him and corrected him and I said, stop it. He's got some things he's got to work through. He just needs love, understanding, and tenderness. And I know how to do that. And he loved me. I was his favorite person on the planet. I'd be preaching and he'd come up and stand beside me while I'm preaching and hug me and lay his head on me, nine years old, just because he loved me. I'd be worshiping and he'd wrap his arm around me and worship and he'd watch me and he'd do everything I do. And he's just amazing. And when he first came to church, he would snap and nobody had to handle him and everybody's trying to throw oil on him and rebuke devils. And... Ah, I don't even know why I'm telling this stuff. One day he just freaked out in church, freaked out. Something happened, somebody touched him, somebody did something, he, he reacted, he freaked out. And I heard it and I ran to, to get in the middle because I knew he loves me. And, and when I said, hey buddy, whoa, whoa, come here, come on, no, no. He just looked at me and he screamed and he bolted out our front door. We got a busy road, we got a lot, it's a city, you don't want a little kid distraught, just running. So I took off. I'm not actually not a slow fella. You might be amazed. I know I got white hair, but I stay in pretty good shape and I could probably catch somebody. Maybe. Not some of you young guys might put, put me to the test, but you might be amazed. My boy brought his friends over to the house and they'd mock him because he couldn't beat me in a sprint and he was on the high school football team and, and he, they, they'd mock him and say, you can't beat your dad. And they'd say, you race him. <laughs> but none of them would because he was faster than them. And, I, and I've jogged for years. I'm a runner. I'm probably about 8, 10 pounds heavier than I like to be, but I can still get it. I can catch a 9-year-old. That's all I'm telling you. 15-year-old, you might, you might be able to stay ahead of me. 17-year-old, you might have me lick, but I can catch a 9-year-old. I took off after him down the park line. I'm running for all I can get. And I'm yelling his name, telling him to stop, and he's just crying and running. He don't even know where he's running. You know what I'm saying? He just lost it. He's, just in this, he's got this thing going on and they want to got him on all these crazy meds. And, and I run and I catch him and I'm calling his name and I said, please, I said, I've got to talk to you. I love you, buddy. And I grabbed him and he turned around and he said, let me go. He's never treated me like that. Let me go. He turned nine years old, is old enough to whoop you if he wants to. I mean, if you don't stop him. 
He starts flailing me. He catches me in the face. Fists. Bam, bam. My instinct was to grab him and restrain him. Well, that's what everybody does. They pin him. They squeeze him. They grip him. And it just enrages things in him. And Jesus spoke to my heart in a flash and said, don't restrain him. And I let that boy beat me up so bad. He just pounded my face and I said, I just love you. I love you so much. I so love you. This is not you, buddy. There's no reason. This is and in the middle of beating me up, I got blood running down. I got I could feel my lips swelling. I could feel my eye already blowing. Because I've been in a few fights. I grew up in the city. <laughs> you better fight or you're gonna get crushed. <laughs> In the middle of me, I saw it in his eyes. It's powerful, the power of love. He goes, <gasps> and he realized, I, I'm hitting him. I love him. Look what I did. And I said, it's okay. Everything's going to be okay. Come here, I love you. He fell on me and bawled and bawled and bawled. And I rocked him and ministered to him. And I can't explain it, but there's something about the power of the Spirit of God. He come into that boy. I could feel him. Touching that boy, he changed that boy. That boy never was the same. And all it cost me was a couple little bruises. Jesus hung on the cross, told me to carry mine. He said, if somebody hits me on the cheek, what am I supposed to do? Block him and give him a sidekick? Turn the cheek. That's not how we grew up, people. Now I got the biggest problem of all. I got to walk him into church and his mama's got to see me beat up. And she got to know that her son did that to pastor. And she's going to feel all what you know she's going to feel. And now I got to deal with a mama that's distraught. Because she can't believe her boy did that to Pastor Dan when I let him. No one takes my life. I freely lay it down. Do those words sound familiar to anyone? I think I'm going to follow Jesus. And probably get his results. <laughs> Man, I could tell you some stories. Because <laughs> I live this way. I don't just preach this way. I, I walked in the church and mama went, oh. I said, everything's right. He's, he's just nestled in me. Because I didn't want her condemning him. I can't believe he did that to pastor. I, I was trying to get her lips to close. There's so much damage when a mouth just runs. In emotion. I'm telling you. And I got her stopped. And then I ended up explaining later and told her. Her boy was never the same. All it took was just a little whooping. <laughs> Thank God it wasn't one of you guys, man. Dude, you'd have put a hurt on me. I could tell. I, gee. I said, God, could you just deliver him? <laughs> Please. <laughs> And I'm not asking you to agree with all that. It's not a counseling technique. It's living by the Spirit. It's in the moment. My instinct was to stop him. Your instinct is to defend yourself and not get beat up. Come on, be honest. The Spirit of God spoke to you in your car driving and said, see that man in the corner? And you look and go, yeah. He's got cut off sleeves. He's tatted all up. And he's got arms that look like somebody stuck your legs on his shoulders. Yeah. And big old beard down there. Big old ring or something, and you like, and he says, "I need you to park your car and go tell that man I love him." And when you do, I want you to know, son, he's gonna rock you, cold cock you right in the jaw. But it's very important that you tell him I love him. And he already, the Lord, spoke to your heart and told you he's gonna rock you when you say. Now, I wonder how many of us would stop the car or say, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> or that probably didn't hear the voice of God because God would be more about protecting me or would just intercede from the car. But wouldn't it be amazing if you'd park the car because you believed you heard that and you went over and you said, hey, man, what do you want? Look, I just was driving by and saw you and I felt really impressed in my heart. I needed to do this to stop my car and tell you one thing, man. What do you want, man? I just need to tell you, man, Jesus really, really loves you. Bam! Blood running. You look, you smile. Man, that don't change a thing. I want you to know he loves you. 
I could tell you a few stories about stuff like that and how the power of God through love changes things. Any man can live for himself. Any man can be his own defense. Any man can love his own life. We've been well good at it. But when you love not your own life unto death, you're following Jesus. It's a place where you'll live free from fear, self-preservation, circumstantial convenience. If any man, that means you're all invited. If any man come after me, the first thing he does, let him deny himself. Why? You were never made for you. You were made for his image. The second thing is you'll pick up your cross. And the third thing is you'll what? Follow me. You'll never follow Jesus if you don't deny yourself. You'll never pick up your cross if you don't deny yourself. Picking up your cross is not letting sin against you produce sin in you. Always overcoming evil with good. Guys, this is what a Christian is. This is what you're called to and created for. It's why Jesus did this radical thing. Got planted in a woman and was born in the flesh. So he fulfilled what man failed to pay the price to put his kingdom back inside of us. And everything that was lost the day Adam ate that tree, he restored through his great shed blood. The biggest lie to our lives is thinking what we've been and everybody else has been is normal. He said, if any man is wise in this age, let him become a fool so he can become wise. The way that seems right to a man has eaten our lunch more than we'll know. And we've incorporated him into something old when all things become new. You guys with me? I covered it Friday. You might not have been here. People say, yeah, but Dan, God gave us emotions. No, nope. Adam gave you your emotions that you grew up with. They all come from a self-centered foundation. When you stop living for yourself, even your emotions start to change without you trying to change. Everything about us growing up was twisted. It wasn't what was from the beginning. Don't say God gave you your emotions. God gave you emotions, but they've got perverted through self-centered foundations. Seminaries teach that God gave us intellect and reasoning ability, and don't let anybody infringe on your God-given right to reason. It's a thin line. God never gave you the ability to talk yourself out of him. The serpent accomplished that. And when they listened to him, they became subservient to that voice and that thing's been messing with the church ever since and people. God didn't give you the ability to talk yourself out of him. All they knew was him. You guys fair with all this? Can I just share one last quick point and just pray over folks and encourage y'all? Are you guys okay? I feel really like intense the last couple of sessions. Yeah, you all right? Good. I'm getting a couple thumbs up. I'll just take the zealots and trust everybody else's heart. No, man, that's good, buddy. Thanks. I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> you know, you say, can I go on? And two people go, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, I hope 12 of them ain't going. Please don't encourage him. He, was, he looked like he was going to wind down. <laughs> no, I got a lot of good head nods there. But I want you to see something about faith real quick. I can do this quick. Not that I'm in a rush rush, but I don't need you to sit there long. My goal on Sunday is never to keep you sitting a long time. We got families. We got life in front of us. Really, it's a time to come, gather together, really look around, connect, encourage one another and realize, man, there's an army. I'm not the only one believing this thing. Man, we got a family. We're in the kingdom. You cheer each other on. You stay focused and you leave here empowered to live your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so on. Do you know why the church came up? This is true. Folks that have been around a while will probably be able to bear witness to this. You've been Christians for a while. I can tell the way you carry, you've just been in this thing, right? And you just carry yourself that way. It's good. It's, it's a compliment. Church came up years ago with a midweek service because the idea was Monday to Sunday is a long time. You get drained out. You need to come and get juiced. Hey, am I telling the truth? 
You guys can bear witness to that. I felt like you knew that. That's why I came right over here. Isn't, think with me. Isn't that amazing, the mentality we have? That life is so powerful that we drain and we leak and we get cracked and we get broken. And we've made it so about us that the gospels become a band-aid and survival kit instead of a transformed life. So we make a midweek service to get a shot in the arm to make it to Sunday because Sunday to Wednesday's plenty of time to get hurt, burned out, or broken. Wow. <laughs> it sounds weak when you talk about it, really. But in the moment, it sounds spirit. It sounds like it makes sense because of the motive Christians were living by. They made it all about them getting something from God instead of them becoming more like him. It was a shot in the arm. <laughs> People say, look, come up. You need fill because we leak. You're not supposed to leak through cracks. You're supposed to leak on people. <laughs> and when you leak, you're filling back up. Watch this. Can you tell just how wore out and drained and dry I've gotten of the, since the first night? Can you tell <laughs> that I'm like almost totally expended? And that if we don't wrap up soon, that, you know, if I don't crawl back up to the mountain soon, I just might not make it. Can you tell? Here's the deal. He's anointed my head and my cup runneth over. I'm not pouring out of my cup. You're, you're splashing in my overflow. Spirituality is measured by overflow. If you're drinking from my cup, of course I'm going dry. No one's ever been able to make me even closely think I was going dry. 21 years, I don't even know what drying up means. People say, well, we don't want to burn you out in a weekend. That's hilarious to me. <laughs> was this in San Diego? I preached for nine hours one day. Hour, five minute break, hour, five minute. They scheduled it. He said, well, then we're going to hold you to your word because we want to get as much out of you as we can. And when I got there, he said, I hope I didn't overextend you because I went for it. I said, you can't. He said, well, here's the schedule. And I laughed and said, you're awesome. And I was so wired at the end of nine hours of preaching. I literally had to go to bed by faith. <laughs> I was. Because you're not, he's anointed my head, my cup, and my fullness comes from him. I'm not drawing my identity from ministry. I've drawn my identity from him, and I minister from that place. It's, it's a cup running over. Spirituality is measured by overflow. We're not dry cups. You see what I'm saying? And when am I not anointed? When is he not Lord? When am I not called to be an example and to live my life in Christ? Is it when I get up in the pulpit? Or is it when I wake up in the morning? So I don't need a Wednesday service to rejuvenate and to stay focused and to get fixed, to get pumped back up. Man, you ought to be pumped up when you wake up and stand up out of your bed and realize you're blameless and holy and above reproach and he loves you. And while you were yet a sinner, he sent his son and he had his eyes fixed on your destiny all along and you couldn't mess him up enough to make him change his mind. And now you're finally on track. Wow, God, no one has loved me this amazingly. I am so pumped to be alive. And all of a sudden you go by the full length mirror on your way out the door and go, I've done this so many times you have no idea when nobody's around. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Sir, you're walking in righteousness. I look at you and I can see you totally believe God loves you. Your countenance reveals that. When I look into your eyes, sir, I see the love of God in you. Man, this is amazing. God has done a work in you and it's evident to me. Man, I don't even know why you're standing here. People out there need what I see in you. Man, you are going to have the most amazing day. Just head right on out. <laughs> I've been driving in my car, looking at traffic, checking my rear view, and you catch your one eye. You know how sometimes when you have a mirror, you can just see your one eye. I go, oh, I see you. <laughs> And his presence, the Lord, comes into my car. You have no idea. It's so powerful. Why? Because I'm like a little kid and I believe. So I'm either loco and need to get a hobby. Or I'm on to something. Is that like texting? What? Is that like texting? Oh, no, no. Because this, this is a Jesus thing right here, buddy. <laughs> They say he's so not distracted. When you're checking your mirrors, you just see your eye, right? Oh, see you in there. Jesus just come in your car. I had Todd's daughter with me one day. Todd, my buddy Todd White. 
we were going to the Kingdom Living School and the worship song was on and I was just having a, a time. It was one of them bedroom times, but she was sitting there, so I was trying to be okay because there's personal stuff. There's times, there's things I am when, see, you think I'm intense, you've never seen me alone. I'm just telling you. You never see me, just me and him shouting and pacing my bedroom, arms flailing, spirit of God ravaging me, face-to-face -face communion, God being so real. That's why I'm like this, because I seek him in the secret, and he sees me there, and he rewards me in the open. What am I seeking in secret? Him. What's my reward in the open? Him. So I, I got personal. This song was touching me because it was something so real in my life, something that I experienced and something that I haven't. I started to talk to the Lord and I could feel this thing coming on me and this communion thing. And it's like, psst, he's like, psst, you know, it's coming. And I'm like, I'm sorry, girl. Oh, man, this just got me fired and a tear filled my eye. She said, no, it's okay. Next thing you know, I'm driving. I'm not telling you to do this. Don't you do this, camera running. Don't do it. It just happened. It happens to me and I don't even realize it probably. I just started, God, I just started... She, she was sitting there like this. <laughs> she said for over a quarter mile, I never touched the steering wheel and didn't even look. And I was just overwhelmed. Now, I don't know that I do that, but I did it that morning. And she said, I finally, I was like, yeah. And I just started driving. I said, I'm sorry. That just, man, honey, that's what God. And I started ministering to her, and calling her in, inviting her into this kind of communion. And she said, after it got quiet, a little quieter, and I was settling down, she said, you like realize you didn't even touch the wheel. I didn't even think you were driving for like a long time. Like we went down that whole stretch and I said, really? Yeah. I was like, I said, well, if he's going to do that to me, he'll probably drive the car. He's pretty good. <laughs> and, so, but, but, and that's different than you driving crazy and speeding and saying, well, I'm drunk in the spirit. I wasn't speeding. I just wasn't driving. <laughs> but the car was fine. See, I tell these little stories because they're important because they're why I'm the way I am. It's like the single mom that's driving down the back road around the city to get out of the traffic lights of the city. So there's a little loop we all take and I'm coming down the road in my truck and I don't even see them. She coming in her van with her three little kids. They all come to our church, single mama. God delivered her from uh, heroin. God sent her to our town, heard the name York, came, found our women's shelter, came to our church, got delivered of heroin, prostitution, social services from another state, gave her back her kids, first time on unprecedented in their history that a state released children to a mother in another state unheard of if you understand that kind of stuff dying of hepatitis liver swelling liver transplant list completely healed of hepatitis liver restored no transplant she's driving in her van and she says, oh, look, kids, here comes Pastor Dan. They love me. They all jump at the windows. They're all going to do the wave thing as I go flying by, right? Not flying, but I'm going by and I'm just driving. I never saw them. I'm cruising. They said I'm laughing, pointing, talking, nobody in the truck. That's common. I'm not talking to myself. I'm not distracted. I'm not bored. I'm in love. I'm in fellowship and relationship with the God of the universe. And his desire is to live inside of me and have friendship. I'm going to let that matter most. We're filling so many gaps in our lives with things and won't admit it and face it. And if you ever get to know him, you'll find a healthy use of all the blessings around us. Watch what these kids did. They're driving smart mama. They're driving. She said, when I went by, I never even looked. I'm laughing. She said, I was laughing. My arm was going. She said, I was like talking. And she said, they realized there's nobody in the car. Because I just had a little single cab truck. There's, you couldn't have missed nobody. There's nobody there. And she said, the kids went instantly silent. They just, they just, they're looking and they went. She said, she drove down the road a good ways, maybe four, three, four, five hundred 500 yards. And she said, they, they didn't say a word. They were just sitting quiet. She didn't say a word. She just let them think. Because they caught me the way I am. And guess what she said? She said, well, kids, I guess we just saw firsthand why he is the way he is. I guess he just doesn't do that because he's on the platform. I guess we just saw firsthand on a back road with nobody else around why Pastor Dan is the way he is. 
And here's the thing, kids. We can all have that if we want that. And we can all pursue that, kids. And then, because they love me, she could... You know how you love him. You know how you're attracted to him, how you run to him. Your life could be that way to others. And we just saw the reason why. Yeah? What a good testimony, huh? It's not always just about healing and deliverance. It's about living in the light as he's in the light. And any man that abideth in him, 1 John 2, ought to walk even as he walked. So now I blew my 15 minutes on them couple stories. Do you see how anointed I am to eat time? <laughs> I'm not going to preach this. I'm just going to shout it out for a second or two. And I'm not going to get, because if I open my Bible, it's going to be dangerous. It's, what am I kidding? It's already, because the Bible's right here. It's like, it's right here in my heart. It's crazy. <laughs> I'm so not unarmed just because I laid that down. <laughs> I just want to nail this one thing down so you can take this with you and, and then I'll say goodbye and we'll hug and stuff maybe if you want to. And, and Yeah, and then I'll head home today. I'm glad I came. I'm glad I got to be here. When we think of faith, so many times we think of faith as a tool in your God belt as if it's something you do to get results. Faith is something you apply to get results. And there's a use of faith in that manner. Of course, scripturally it is. But I assure you, if you'll study out your Bible and you'll look, the primary use of faith, the word faith in your Bible, is a perspective you live by in the face of every situation. The Gospels calls it the faith. He's not talking about faith to get a new job. Faith to believe you won't get laid off. He's not about faith to get healed. That's an aspect of faith, but it's just an aspect of faith. The primary use of faith in the New Testament is a perspective you live by, knowing who you've become now that he came, and never losing sight of that in the face of opposition and trial. The Bible talks about the faith. Paul said, I've... Run the race. Sounds like he was in something with purpose. He wasn't saved waiting to go to heaven. I've run the race. I've fought the... I've kept the... I've kept the faith. Colossians 2 says, established in the faith. Romans 3 says, obedience to... The faith. First Peter 5 says, Satan's roaming like a roaring lion, seeking to devour, resist him, standing steadfast in the faith. He's talking about a perspective that you receive, an identity. You get it? The faith. Contending for fighting the good fight of faith. It's, it's never losing sight of who you've become and what you're motivated by in the midst of life. It's a perspective. Are you following me? It's very important to get this. When you look at the patriarchs of faith, Abraham, by faith, left. He didn't know where he was heading. It was a perspective. I'm going to trust you, Moses, as seeing one that's invisible, right? He, he, he left. He didn't, when he was of age, he didn't stay under Egypt. He came out to be with his people. He didn't fear the wrath of the king. It, it was by faith. He said, you know what? I'm trusting it all with God. I have a different vision, a different focus now. You get it? You look at the patriarchs of faith and almost all the uses of faith are a perspective that took them to a finish line. you got Paul getting beat and, and whipped and stoned for the gospel. How do you get through that? You don't lose sight. Keep your eyes on the faith. How do you get chained to a wall with Silas and your back's split open wide and you're worshiping God instead of the... Potential American mentality, forgive me for that, I'm not being sarcastic. We've just made this gospel so much about our blessing, we don't handle adversity well. If we're not careful. Because the average American Christian is, God, I'm trying to do your work, why aren't you protecting me? My goodness, you need to heal my back, this hurts, I can't believe i got to go through this. I thought you paid for my protection. 
Look, if you're not going to guard me and protect me, I am not going to keep preaching this gospel. If you're going to let me go through this, I am confused. Where are you, God? That's a common conversation in people. They don't even know how to think that. Why? They're already dead and surrendered. They're living the faith. They're worshiping God in chains with meat split on their back. Be real. And whips weren't cool. That whipping killed a lot of folks. And they're singing praises to God. Yeah, so powerful. The faith. The faith. So I want you to understand. I'll close with this scripture. This, this is the one I'll read to you. And I'll read it out of the Bible and not quote it. It just seems more effective. You can turn there if you want. It's Galatians 2.20. Most people know and can quote that when you say it. They know the address. Galatians 2.20. So I didn't, I didn't share a lot of the scriptures on this, but do you understand that it's the faith is in a lot of phrases, the faith. It's all through the New Testament. I quoted a handful of them. But the Bible, oh, but here's what Paul said in uh, Philippians 3. He said, he said, I haven't apprehended, but I'm going to press forward so I can lay a hold of that goal, that high mark, that thing God called me to. I'm not there yet, but I'm going after it. And the one thing, the one thing, not a three-point sermon, the one thing I'm doing, I'm forgetting what lies behind, and I'm reaching for what lies ahead. Why? So I can lay a hold. Pay attention to this. I know I talked a lot, but grab this. Lay a hold to lay a hold of that which Jesus laid a hold of me for. Jesus obtained you with intention. He has purpose and vision and destiny for you. He didn't save you to blow a trumpet someday and your name's on the list, so yeah, you made heaven. Paul is pursuing to lay a hold of that which Jesus laid a hold of him for. The reason grace drew him in the first place, because no man comes unless he's drawn. So here's a young man with a desire for God, right in the front row. He's just listening, man. You, you've been listening, right? So grace, it says nobody comes to God on his own. Grace has drawn you. Why would God draw you to him? Because he wants you. Right? It's so amazing. He says, to lay a hold of that which Jesus laid a hold of me for. It's Philippians 3. And he says, if any of you have any other mind or belief in this matter, I pray God even reveal this to you. Therefore, no matter where you are spiritually, what level you feel you've arrived, let us all walk by the same mind, by that same will. Whew. That's intense. That puts us into unity. In other words, we all have different callings and directions and passions and burnings and giftings. Some of us love music. Some of us just want to feed the homeless. Some of us just want to hold children. Some of us want to go to a foreign land. That doesn't make us different. We all do it from the same place for the same goal. His image. It's the unity of faith. How can we have one mind, one faith, and have so many different callings and passions in the room? This one room, there's so much diversity, you could hardly put your finger on it. And yet we're all called to be one. How? We all wake up to love. And we all wake up to look like him. That's the unity of faith. And how blessed and precious it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. It's that full flask of anointing. It's that place of power and purpose. That's what the Psalms is trying to say. Yeah? Whew. Check this out. Now I'm done with you guys. I, well, I'm not done. I just won't hold you anymore. I heard a belly growl or something. I'll just quit. Galatians 2.20. And please take to heart these things, man. Please don't take them lightly. I have been crucified with Christ. Would you guys, I didn't explain and show you a ton of scripture, but would you be safe to say, would you, would you be able to agree with me without having to go research it out, that it's safe to say that the use of the phrase, the faith, has more to do with a perspective and a view you live from than a tool you're using to get a prayer answered. Is that okay? So would you agree that faith is a perspective, an eye that you live from? Right? Like what did they do in the patriarch's faith? They, 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 they saw themselves as sojourners, pilgrims, seeking a better land, seeking a homeland. 
They saw themselves, they saw this life as, hey guys, just passing through. We're not living for right now per se. We're living for that day. But now matters. We're going to make it count because we have faith. We're living for that day. So they embraced those promises, never obtained them, and died without receiving that promise. But let the perspective of faith take them through all the stuff they went through. And it talks about the list of trials and persecutions. It says of them, the world was not worthy. Whew. I don't know, man. You want that testimony. I'm sure that sounds pretty good. I think that's something we want. Yeah. <laughs> I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Because I'm going to interchange. with Christ and it's no longer I who live but it's Christ living in me and the life which I now live in this body I live by the faith of the Son of God I've been crucified with Christ Yet I live, but it's no longer I who live. For the life I now live, I live by the perspective of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You get it? So how are you going to live? I'm going to love you and give myself for you. And greater love hath no man than this. He lay down his life for another. For freely you receive, freely give. It's way better to give than... Did you get it? The life I now live, I'm going to live by what made him tick. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Because he knew my value, purpose and potential. So if I know the same, I can live like him. And be restored back to that truth. You follow me? Good. Let's pray something right now. Father, I just thank you for your word. I just thank you for every heart here. I just thank you for the attentiveness. Father, even in the, in the length sometimes of just sitting. and I just, I just pray that nothing gets lost. I, I just pray that everything gets sown into the hearts of every person here. It's been a fun time. It's just been a good time. Just to stir and to sober and to think. And just to repent, maybe look at a few things. A young lady standing up crying, saying, you know, I was a victim all those years. And now I went, no, 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 that is not what I am. My life is so much more now that he's come. The last thing I need to be is a victim when he's come to deliver me and put his life inside of me. So it's not about who did what to me. It's about what he did for me and what he wants to do through me that matters way more than my old story. Because his story is greater. Father, I pray that everyone in this room has the faith and finds the grace to live from that truth. And I pray that you restore and that you make things healthy and you make things whole. Yeah, okay. Look, I don't know how many marriages are sitting here. I'm not going to make you stand up. Nobody's going to know who you are. But it's in my heart, even if it's a marriage that, that fits this, it's worth taking the minute. But if you're listening to all this and you're hearing this, but in your heart you're saying, man, it hasn't been this way and I haven't been pursuing this at home. And wow, I had my eyes on my spouse and I was, I'm really being challenged and adjusted in this. What I'd love you to do, if you would, my eyes are closed. This has been so powerful what God's doing. And I'd love you if you're willing and you have that conviction and you're going, man, I'm hearing you, Pastor. And there's time for change in my life and I've been getting my eyes on the wrong things and it's time to look to my own life and be a steward of my own heart and not try to steward my spouse's heart. I would love you to reach over and just squeeze their hand and if you're their spouse, man, don't take your hand away. Don't pull it away or cringe because all they're trying to say without words because words get in the way sometimes just by taking your hand, they're saying, I want you to know, honey, I'm listening to this man and I'm hearing him for me and I haven't been walking in all these things and I haven't pursuing Christ like I could and I just want you to know the Lord has my attention and I, 
I'm seeing things through this eye and I'm asking you to forgive me and receive that forgiveness. And I want you to know I'm ready to look more like Jesus than ever before. You could be the woman grabbing the man. You could be the man grabbing the woman. I'm telling you, if you grab their hand, it's just something powerful about that humility and expression that is more powerful than talking through all this stuff and getting emotionally in trouble. It's just something about making a statement. I'm ready to become more like him. And if they squeezed your hand, spouse, man, just squeeze it back. Don't pull it away. Squeeze it back. And if you squeeze it back, here's what you're saying. Man, I received that, honey, and I appreciate that. And I want you to know I'm hearing this man, too. And I got my eyes off of you and I'm done complaining and sorry for not pursuing the higher things. But I'm definitely here in this man and I'm looking forward to life with you. Father, I thank you. Just please do that. If you're in, in here and it, and it fits your heart, take that risk and just tap them and reach over and get their hand. I haven't opened my eyes. I don't, it's not my business who's doing it. It doesn't mean you have trouble. It means you're making a statement personally to your spouse. That's why I want it to be personal. So, Father, I pray for every marriage here, every one that's holding hands. If your spouse is in here and you would hold their hand, God knows that. So you just sit here and receive this grace. So, Father, I just thank you that we're done taking life personal. We're taking the gospel personal. That you bring restoration into every home and every family. That you make marriages strong. I pray for a supernatural resolve. And a supernatural peace to come into the homes and the marriages represented here. Those ones that held hands, God. I'm asking for a profuse grace to come upon their families, their marriages, and their relationship. Let their minds stay clear and let their hearts stay free. Father, I'm asking you to restore without a bunch of words. Restore without a bunch of going back and opening doors. Just give them a new day. And just put them in a fresh place. Yeah, you can do that, Lord. You can put them in a fresh place. So, Father, I thank you. That's the case right now. And I just thank you. Our lives and our families are going to more look more like you than ever before because we want them to. And, Father, we just thank you for your word and we thank you for your love. Father, I pray for health and wholeness over these families. And I just pray for... <laughs> His sister used this word with me this weekend. It's in my heart, this violent, this violent expression of grace in our lives to hold us fast to this word. And Father, if any way our minds start going some other place and we start slipping into something old, Holy Spirit, I ask you to illuminate us and redirect us and father us and keep us in the path of truth. I bless this house. I bless these folks. And I thank you for the privilege in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Just felt like a teaching time. I don't, didn't feel like, I just, I feel done. I feel like a teaching time. Don't always expect there has to be an altar call or ministry or prayer. You can always pray for one another too. We've been teaching that all weekend. If you got something in your life or your body, man, grab somebody and say, hey, can you stand with me and pray with me? Man, I've been struggling with this or I've been struggling with that in my flesh or this pain. Can you just stand with me and agree? We've done it all weekend. Some folks have gotten healed. Some folks have gotten encouraged in praying for each other. And one lady went home at night and didn't feel no change. and got in bed and realized her body was healed. That's pretty cool. Why? Because we taught that it's not a point in time. It's relational. It's a position of your heart. You guys good? Listen, I'm going to ask Dan, you come up and pray over people or do whatever you want. I just feel like I'm done. I feel like the plane landed. <laughs> no, seriously. So bless you. Thanks for the weekend. Thanks for just being here. Young men, run well, okay? I appreciate your hearts. A whole row of young men, I appreciate it. Don't let anything discourage your hearts, okay? If you start feeling bummed out about anything, I'm telling you, it's a sign of deception. There's another way to look. So be encouraged and run well, guys, okay? Bless you. See you. What? I know every one of these people would love to do this, but thank you so much, David. They had the opportunity. Well, amen. No, it's my privilege. Well, as you guys realize I'm here because I want to be, right? Look, I could be a lot of places. I could be at home. It's not like God came in my bedroom and said, go to Macomb. You need to get there. I know you'd like to hear that. That would make it personal, right? But it's just as personal to know that I pulled you out of a stack of hundreds through meeting him and just said, you know what? I think I want to go to that little town and I just want to speak to the folks that show up. I'm here because I want to be. It's not a career. It's not a way of living. I didn't come here so you pay my bills next month. I came here because I believe the message I preach and I believe you're worth the blood. That's why I came. So God bless you. Take it to heart and run well, okay? All righty.
Bye-bye. Sure.